Good evening. It is 7.03, and we're calling tonight's meeting of the Environmental and Natural Resources Commission to order. We'll begin with roll call. And I need my list. All righty. So Commissioner Broadnax is absent this evening. Commissioner Bryan is absent this evening. Uh, Commissioner Doser has uh, resigned from the commission, so she is absent as well. Commissioner Gill? Present. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner Palzer is here. And Commissioner Redman? Here. Excellent. So that takes care of roll call. Um, then let's move on to agenda item number three, approval of minutes. Or, I'm sorry, approval of the agenda. So um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda as submitted? Madam Chair, no staff changes. Okay. I'll make a motion to accept the agenda as printed. Okay, motion by Commissioner Miller to accept the agenda as submitted. Is there a second? I'll second. Commissioner Gill has seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Eyes all for that. And then um, agenda item number four is the approval of minutes from the April 18th, 2022 meeting of the commission. So. Uh, notes on that were in our packet that was sent. Were there any corrections uh, or additions to the mi meeting minutes from last month? Not that I could see. Okay, doesn't sound like there's any additions or corrections. I was not present for the meeting, so um, I <laughs> don't have anything to add, but I also can't uh, vote on their acceptance. So um, is there a motion to... Approve the minutes from the April 18th meeting as submitted. I'll move to approve. Moved by Commissioner Redmond. Is there a second? I can second. Seconded by Commissioner Miller. So all in favor of approving the minutes from April 18th meeting, say aye. 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 So we have three ayes, and then I will abstain. Two since... ayes. I was abstaining as well. Okay, so two ayes, two abstentions. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Is that, can we do that? Or do we have to have a quorum? Is there a quorum necessary for approving minutes? If if so, I guess we table that till next month. If not, move it forward. Sounds good. Check later, Thank retroactively. You. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. So that takes us to agenda item number five, which is new business. Uh, agenda item or item A under that is Maplewood Greenhouse Gas Assessment. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. So tonight we are going to get a presentation from Ted Redman of Pale Blue Dot. Ted, of course, is also a, an, an environmental commissioner here with us. And just a brief uh, introduction. Uh, the city of Maplewood has been uh, conducting greenhouse gas assessments since uh, 2015, 16, mm -hmm. I believe, which is considered our baseline greenhouse gas assessment. And we do this for several reasons. Um, one is we are a green step cities, and it is a requirement of uh, monitoring our greenhouse gas and, and our continued sustainability metrics as part of that green step cities. It also helps us make improvements um, and uh, manage and monitor our energy and climate action goals that were identified in our 2040 comprehensive plan. So tonight we're we're getting a briefing of the greenhouse gas assessment that was conducted in 2020 uh, for our most current metrics that we submitted with the Green Step Cities program. And we really wanna focus in on um, where are our areas that we can really make improvement so that during our next discussion item, which is um, climate uh, adaptation mitigation strategy priorities, um, we have a better understanding of where we can really make that impact. So with that, I will turn it over to Ted Redman. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sean. So because it's a small group, I think I'll just be informal and stay here, if that's okay with everybody. All righty. So, all right, the clicker works. So I just thought I'd uh, maybe expand just a tidge on what Sean was talking about related to uh, introduction, um, and then give you sort of a findings in brief on municipal operations, GHG, and community-wide GHG. Um, a little observations related to trend lines, uh, particularly for uh, community-wide. And then just identifying from that potential priorities for reduction. 
Uh, these are not necessarily project uh, action projects, but maybe just based on the uh, inventory, where might be the more persnickety areas that we could prioritize if desired. So that's what I thought I'd go over. Uh, so as uh, Sean indicated, uh, we uh, have do typically do these inventories in association with the Green Step Cities data submission, which is due in April. Now, some of the data that we use for community-wide is not available until July of the calendar year for the year previous. And because of that, meaning that it's not available when we need to submit for Green Step Cities, because of that, then what we're actually doing is the inventory for two calendar years away, or it's about, you know, whatever, 14 months or so when we do the inventory. So in other words, for 2022, when we submitted, we were submitting for the year 2020 uh, inventory. Uh, we have uh, a full report is available. I, I, I know that the city has it. We also have established a uh, Maplewood Greenhouse Gas Emissions Dashboard website uh, that you can go to a web page that has a uh, copy of the full report as well as some of the um, charts and data trend lines that I'll be going through here. Uh, a little bit about Pale Blue Dots. So uh, as um, uh, Sean has indicated, we've done uh, annual updates since 2016, which started with the 2015 uh, year. And uh, we've done uh, greenhouse gas inventories for over 30 communities, multiple states from uh, Minnesota through to Vermont, actually New Hampshire, we're doing one in New Hampshire right now. So we've, we've got a little bit of experience. Okay, so a little bit about uh, just sort of a snapshot, um, the um, findings in brief, starting with the municipal operations. Um, the city's operations greenhouse gas inventory uh, totals uh, just a little under 3,500 metric tons, 3,490 to be exact. Um, breaking that down into the four major uh, uh, components of uh, buildings and streetlights, transportation, solid waste, and wastewater, uh, you'll see how those break down. Buildings and streetlights uh, account for 32.5% of the total emissions. Transportation is the largest. Uh, it accounts for 65%. Uh, solid waste is the smallest at just a tenth of a percent. And water and wastewater accounts for 1.4% uh, of the emissions. So clearly, uh, our largest components are uh, buildings and streetlights and transportation uh, sectors. And you'll see in that uh, donut chart there's two blue areas and there's two sort of orangish areas. The larger, darker blue corresponds to building electricity and uh, uh, building natural gas. And the smaller, uh, light blue corresponds with street light, just to kind of give you a sense as to, you know, the proportions of those. And then in the orange categories, the larger orange category uh, corresponds to the city fleet uh, component. And the smaller, darker uh, orange corresponds to staff transportation. Uh, so that's coming, going to meetings and, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> the trends uh, for municipal operations since uh, 2015 uh, overall are very good. The total emissions have dropped. When we look at it on a sector by sector category, our buildings and streetlights uh, have dropped uh, over 76% in those, uh, well, five plan years, because this is for 2020. Um, and our uh, solid waste has dropped over 56%. We have two sections, uh, and, I, and I'll pause and say that the, the big driver in the buildings and streetlights uh, really is, although there's some energy efficiency going on there, um, the, probably the biggest driver is in the cleaning of our electric grid. Uh, uh, Xcel uh, Energy has been um, they have a, a goal to achieve carbon neutral by 2040, and um, they've been making really good headway at reducing the amount of emissions associated with every kilowatt hour each year. So we're, we're a beneficiary of that using uh, Excel. The uh, two other sectors, transportation and uh, water and wastewater, have both gone up. Uh, transportation about 15%, and water and wastewater up about 16%. Uh, for transportation, that uh, increase is um, associated with city fleet, uh, 
uh, fuel consumed by uh, city fleet. When we look at uh, those emissions, so this now shows you the uh, chart of municipal operations since 2015. Uh, broken down in those same, same categories, so you can kind of see the ebbing and flowing of each of those categories. Um, most importantly, that top dashed blue line uh, is the goal, uh, goal line uh, associated with the city's overall emissions reduction of achieving 80% reduction by 2050. Um, so uh, the emissions are dropping uh, well in advance of the city's current uh, community-wide goal. So that's a good that's a good trend. Now, looking at uh, community-wide emissions, uh, we break them down in the same kinds of categories. We have uh, the energy buildings and energy category, transportation, solid waste, and water wastewater again. Uh, at, for the community-wide uh, emissions, uh, we have a total of three hundred thirty-five thousand seven hundred sixty-one metric tons. Uh, for community-wide emissions in 2020. Um, about 42% of that is for the building sector, uh, electricity and natural gas, and you'll see that uh, electricity is about 26% of that and natural gas about 74% of that, so it's heavier on natural gas. Uh, transportation is about 55% of our total community uh, emissions. Uh, roughly 80% of that is uh, VMT, uh, vehicle use. Uh, ground transportation. Solid waste is uh, just uh, a little over one and a half percent, and water and wastewater uh, use is uh, just a little over half a percent. The fantastic news is in all of those categories, our trend since 2013 uh, has dropped. Uh, buildings and energy, uh, the most significant at over 47 percent. And the other, uh, and uh, uh, transportation and solid waste uh, over 15%, and wastewater uh, and water over 40% drop. So those are really uh, significant changes in the last uh, seven years or so. Um, this shows community-wide emissions over that uh, that history uh, time frame, break, broken down again, so you can see the comings and goings of each uh, sector. Um, you can see that uh, where we are for 2020, we are uh, pretty well underneath the goal, goal line for that year. I will point out that uh, the emission reduction trend for 2020, uh, really the two heavy drivers are our building and energy sector and our transportation sector. Um, the nuance here is that the buildings and energy sector, just like with our uh, municipal operations, the real driver is the sort of cleanliness of our grid, so to speak, the increasing uh, carbon efficiency of our electric grid. Uh, for transportation, for the year 2020, the major driver is COVID. Uh, we saw a vehicle a VMT drop for that year. We're seeing on all of the communities that we're working with that we do inventories for. Um, you know, and optimistically, maybe some of that will show up again. Uh, not all of it, I am quite certain. Uh, I know people are moving around more now, but maybe we'll see some of the trends related to at-home work. Maybe that will, maybe that will stick with us a little bit. So we'll see moving forward. But the point of that is that uh, so our robust reduction uh, showing up in 2020. I'm anticipating we're going to see some of it coming back in 21 or 22 uh, without action. Um, <clears throat> just kind of giving a summary of uh, the emissions uh, numbers. Uh, this is again citywide from 2013 through 2020. Uh, what you see here is the GHG emissions compared. So you can see we've dropped 165,000 metric tons in that time frame. Pretty significant achievement. And you can see the breakdown on uh, met metric tons per person, uh, per job, and also per thousand dollars in GDP. Uh, against all of those metrics, we're down. So it's good. Um, below, we, we see the population numbers, a slight increase. Uh, we see our pro rata share of the county GDP numbers, and you can see an increase. Uh, and also a slight increase in terms of total employment in the city. So I like doing that because, um, well, I got another chart, but oftentimes folks think reduction of GHG 
is at odds with uh, ec economy. And I think we illustrate that's not true. Um, we tend to visualize uh, at least some of our uh, GHG emissions because I find people don't know, I mean, who knows, what is a metric ton of greenhouse gas? I mean, like, we don't deal with that. We can't see it, we can't smell it. So this helps to illustrate that. Um, if you add those two cubes together, that's where our total volume of emissions were for 2013. That uh, orange cube on top uh, relates to the amount of emissions that we have eliminated, annual emissions, uh, since then. So our, the amount of man-made greenhouse gases that we're putting into the atmosphere, man-made uh, atmosphere is the way I like to think of it, has, is reducing pretty significantly over that time frame. Um, for 2020, though, it's still almost 6.6 .6 billion cubic feet of man-made atmosphere. Um, you can kind of see it in comparison to if the Willis Tower uh, from Chicago, uh, the largest tower in Chicago, if that were standing there, uh, it would compare kind of with that lower cube. So just to give you a sense of how much that, that is. This is the chart of the, our, our, this is pro rata share for GDP. That's what we have. We don't have city level data, but county level data. Uh, but our pro rata share in terms of the uh, GDP is the green line and our change in greenhouse gas emissions over that same time frame. Uh, you can see except for the 2020 year, which again relates to COVID, I think, um, our GDP has continually up, uh, increased while our GHG emissions have con continually decreased. So uh, that does illustrate that the two do not have to be negatively linked. In fact, in many ways, they could be positively linked. Um, we often get a question about, um, well, how about uh, carbon sequestration? Huge fan of trees, love grass, love carbon sequestration, but in terms of understanding the order of magnitude, we can't plant, I mean, I don't want to say we don't want to plant trees. Love planting trees, very positive in many ways, but in terms of offsetting all of our carbon, we will never get there by planting green things. Uh, we would need a city... Uh, for 2020 emissions, we would need a city roughly 23 times the size of what we have in order to offset all of our carbon. So, again, we want, to, we want the green things. They've got great benefits in all sorts of ways, um, but completely offsetting our emissions is not one of them. This chart just shows the trend lines of our emissions for each of those uh, sectors. Um, so you can see that, you know, in general, our electric sector has been on a really positive downward trend. Uh, natural gas was on a pretty positive downward trend for half the journey, and then over the other half of the journey, it's been rising again. Uh, I think that's in relationship to um, largely it's going to be driven by uh, weather. You know, we have these cold snaps that have been happening in January. Uh, this year was kind of funky, so we're, we're going to see that kind of creep up again, I think. Um, but that's an area uh, that we could, uh, you know, we should pay attention to. Transportation also has been relatively... Uh, Actually, not really flatline. It's been a slow increase every year, except for 2020. Uh, and I don't think we want to repeat a co uh, COVID every year, so that's probably not the strategy. Uh, solid waste has been on a reasonable downward trend. Uh, wastewater uh, was flatlined, but has begun to drop a bit. And our emissions associated with water has been on a, a, a nice downward trend. That's due entirely to the electricity used to move our water. Uh, which is what shows up under our, our city's responsibility. Um, so those are uh, linked. So out of all that stuff, uh, just kind of looking at the sort of high-level potentials, uh, this is not to say specific actions necessarily. Um, I, of course, would never discourage action in any of the categories. <laughs> we need action everywhere we can get it. Uh, and, of course, when we start thinking about projects, it's a mixture of uh, what's appropriate for the city, what's good timing, uh, what can we get done, what's motivating, all these things, right? But just in terms of like, well, if we were to look at sectors that, that might be worth considering for priority for reduction, the two that pop out are transportation and natural gas. <clears throat> Those two sectors um, are electricity. If uh, Certainly continuing to increase renewable energy is fantastic and appropriate and brings with it other benefits like the potential for uh, energy independence, addressing uh, uh, energy burden, those sorts of things. But in terms, just purely looking at it from a GHG perspective, 
natural gas between in, within our building sector, natural gas is really our, the target that we maybe want to start looking at. Um, electricity will, if Excel is successful, will continue to reduce. Natural gas will not. The emissions associated with natural gas do not change as long as you're burning fossil fuel natural gas. Um, and transportation. Uh, historically, VMT trends, as I say, are upward. Um, aside from the COVID experience, we would expect that they would also continue to go upward. It's the history of our country and our region. So uh, that also is an area to consider, uh, in, focusing on vehicle mile reduction, as well as increasing EV, because that does help reduce emissions on a per mile basis. When we uh, look back to the um, city operations, again, the, the two sectors that kind of pop out would be transportation, uh, specifically uh, uh, fuel consumed for the city fleet, and you know, potentially exploring uh, uh, increasing in EV opportunities, and decreasing in water consumption and wastewater generation. Now, in terms of uh, GHG impacts, You'll note, of course, water and wastewater is a small percentage. So, you know, do we want to put our energies there versus, you know, continue to increase uh, building efficiency and electrification and so forth? I mean, that's something to think about. But just looking at it sector-wise, those are the two sectors that are going uh, and not in the same direction uh, we ultimately want them to. So with that, thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner Redman and Pale Blue Dot as here. You bet. <laughs> okay, you know, having both functions there, um, thanks for all the information and laying it out um, in a way that's easy to follow as well as explaining kind of the, the results and summarizing those. I appreciate it. Or we appreciate it. Um, let's see. So I'm just going to switch back to our packet, I believe. that this was an item for discussion, um, only no action, and, and I know that that feeds into the next agenda item as well. Um, are there any questions or discussion points on this that we'd like to go through before we go to the climate adaptation agenda item? Commissioner Miller? I just wanted to thank you, Ted, for all of this because it's always refreshing to have solutions along with the issues that we're having because that gives you somewhere to go and um, I just really appreciate that that's how you present this stuff. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. <clears throat> I was wondering if uh, Ted could address maybe how he thinks we're doing of course much of it is thanks to Excel and uh, their work on cleaning the grid but how we're doing on our energy goals uh, as outlined in the comprehensive plan, which, of course, we're following the state goals. The city will follow the state energy goal guidelines of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 20% of the city's 2015 baseline levels by 2050 and looking at future interim goals um, that we want, might want to establish at the completion of the first interim time frame. What do we call the first interim time frame, first of all? First checkpoint of sorts? Is that what? Yeah, and in, in terms of the year also, I can't, I can't remember what year we had established. Oh, uh, is the interim? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, recall. interim goals every five to 10 years. Yeah. There we go. That's why I can't recall. We haven't established it. <laughs> so that was 2019. 20, 21, 22, we're three years in from our established goals. Um, it's, do you have a crystal ball? What do you think, how do you think we're doing? What do we need? Well, these charts, uh, citywide, this chart gives you a snapshot of how we're doing against those, those stated goals. So the short answer is we're doing pretty well, you know. Uh, even uh, readjusting for transportation, we would be below uh, that uh, target line. Um, so I think I think community wide we're we're doing pretty well, and uh, municipal operations were were kicking it pretty nicely. Um, the 
when you when you start pulling across pulling apart those uh, trend lines that I was showing, oops, there, which this is for community wide, but I think it's re relatively reflected with municipal operations also. Um, our transportation and our natural gas sectors are are I think lagging what we maybe would want to see for to achieve our longer term goals. You know, so 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 far we're really. Uh, we're, we're ahead of our schedule, so to speak, but if we start projecting those out as a business as usual sort of projection, we're gonna start, the lines are gonna start crossing unless we uh, are able to successfully deal with those two components. Um, for municipal operations, uh, well, and actually, we, I think if I recall correctly, and from the comprehensive plan, uh, there were goals for renewable energy for both municipal operations and for community-wide. Uh, that goal is an area that would also could benefit with focus. Um, I think we're we're behind schedule on both of those. The GHG inventory itself does not necessarily spell that out uh, because it's focused on the emissions, uh, the resulting emissions of where we're getting our energy sources. But I can say that um, for both, I think we're below our targets. How much renewable energy we have, which uh, and I'll. Pause here to also throw out, because I like to say this every time I do, uh, whenever we talk about renewable energy and greenhouse gas inventories, of course in the state of Minnesota we're very lucky to have multiple ways of securing renewable energy and, and or supporting it. One of them is community solar. And of course we have community solar, we have individuals and businesses in the community that have signed up for community solar and the city has signed up for community solar. I love community solar. I fully support it. It's fantastic. A very important nuance to understand, though, is that when you sign up for community solar, if you are accounting your greenhouse gas emissions, you must account that electricity at the level that the base grid is at. And that is because the uh, renewable energy credits, so every, every time somebody s puts electricity into the grid from a renewable energy source, uh, it's tracked through a mechanism called a renew renewable energy credit. It separates the electrons from the green attributes of that electricity, from the, the source that it was generated. The reason for that is that our grid is fluid. So nobody really knows the electron that's coming into this computer right now, nobody really knows where it came from. We just know the different sources from which it could have come. <laughs> and so if you are... Uh, if you have a renewable energy, if you have a, a solar system on your building and it's coming into your building, um, uh, that typically you own the RECs. There are times when you don't, but I don't want to get too complicated. In the case of a, a community solar, though, the RECs are being sold, typically, usually to Excel. So it benefits everybody in the grid, but you can't account that as... 100% green solar. You have to count it as um, emission, base grid emission. And so the reason why it. I point that out is that it's, while it's, a, so it's fantastic to do if, uh, for instance, while we're counting municipal operations, um, if we wanted to achieve, you know, uh, net carbon zero, or we wanted to achieve 100% renewable energy, if we are purchasing community solar we would have to offset whatever we're purchasing by purchasing RECs or s offset in some other way. Otherwise, that uh, energy will always be at the same value as the grid. So now we're still supporting solar, so it's still a good thing. It's just from an emission standpoint, we, we don't account it as renewable. So that's a super long answer of saying we could focus on renewable energy, <laughs> natural gas, and transportation components. But if we do, did focus on renewable energy, ensuring that we realize if it's community solar, we're not gonna get the credit for it and it's not gonna be reflected in our greenhouse gas assessment. That's right. It'll be reflected on usually Xcel Energies. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and some, some uh, businesses or municipal operations will, if they, if they decide that uh, community solar, investing further in community solar is the right thing for them, uh, oftentimes you can do that at a financial savings. And so I have seen some users then earmark a portion of those financial savings to purchase RECs so that it's reflected in their 
uh, inventories. So, you know, if you save, I'm going to make up numbers, say you're going to save 10% on your community solar off of your electricity, you know, purchasing REC is probably going to be a fraction of that. So you, you should still be able to come out of it saving money, but not as much. Or another way of using community solar to help fuel reductions is to say the savings that we have in our uh, community solar electricity, we're going to take that and we're going to earmark it for uh, on-site solar installation or some other, you know, GHG emission reducing action. Um, so you're using it as a way of funding crushing down emissions somewhere else. How about purchasing uh, wind? Yep. You know how you can do on Excel Energy? Yep. As a resident, I know I've, yep. I've done this, wind power. Yep. There's, there's three, simplifying it, there's three ways you can get renewable. You can put it on your site somewhere and f feed it into your meters uh, and take advantage of that uh, on-site power. You can buy... Uh, community solar, in that instance, it, again, as I was just saying, it doesn't reduce your emissions unless you also purchase REC. Uh, and then the third is to buy it through your utility. So in our instance with Excel, they've got both solar as well as wind source. Um, both of those, when you're purchasing it through your utility, what you're really doing is you're buying a renewable energy credit that just happens to be provided by the utility. Uh, that's what happens to the community solar wrecks is they're gonna they're gonna come out and that's an opportunity to ad advance so uh, and that does reduce your emissions that that counts as full-on renewable so the city of maplewood could choose to um purchase all of our energy through wind source as an option yep yeah that would be okay an option, yep. very good Yeah, or, or improve uh, energy resilience. You could have a combo. You could have some microgrid. Uh, you could uh, do some direct rec purchasing. Right. Uh, so, you know, there's, you, you can kind of look at it. We've, we've worked with some municipalities to look at it on a building-by-building building basis to say this building consumes however much uh, electricity. This is what it's paying for electricity plus demand charges, uh, depending on the tariff that it's under. And then based on that structure, um, on-site solar might be the best option. Buying a renewable energy credit through the market might be the best option. Or buying, you know, uh, community solar with a rec combination or buying it through the utility. So it might, you know, generally buying it through the utility will increase your costs. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's the bad thing. It just is usually the price structure set up that way. That if you're paying, I'm going to make up a number, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, for electricity, if you buy uh, renewable through your utility, usually it goes up a bit. Because you're buying the right to use it. Yeah. Or you're to paying. claim it. Well, exactly. and they, yeah. yeah, the utility has built in their infrastructure to capture that. Yeah. So right. it's yeah. passing the cost along, which makes sense. So that doesn't mean that's a bad option. Yeah. It's just one of the m metrics that you may use to decide where you do what for what rights. building. Maybe my question might be a little bit different um, focus. I guess, you know, as we're looking at these numbers, like I think any time that you, you know, kind of dive into a goal, you have this like initial momentum, right? Like you're like, okay, we're going to make these changes. Like have we kind of like is the low hanging fruit, like the easy stuff, you know, kind of done already? Like, uh, you know, looking at that trend line that, that you have, like, I mean, hopefully, but like without – making some different choices and changing some things going forward like it isn't automatic that it's going to keep going down that's right. unless there's new solutions introduced in that so thinking about transportation you'd mentioned you know ev vehicles so you know i suppose there's an assumption that just over time with more ev vehicles available to purchase people will be replacing their cars and adding those in so that would you know help it go along but is that kind of thing steady enough without like a huge infusion, like a huge, you know, big change that would need to, to happen to continue, you know, towards that 2050 goal of 80%. I mean, that, remember when we talked about this a few years ago, like that's a, that's a large, I mean, 80% is, is huge, of course, and there's a number of things that you can do to get there, but 
it's encouraging that we're, you know, have already made such progress and kind of are, are continuing or, you know, trending down, but kind of curious if there's anything that you see, you know, as far as advancements or, you know, technology that's coming out, like, you, you know, mentioning cleaning up the grid a little bit. There's probably only so much of that that can be done. Like there's that initial infusion of mm -hmm. they've made those changes and that will level off at some, you know, at some point, but I don't know. It's not a very specific question, but. Yeah. I think it's a great question, and and not to pound too much on the trend lines, but in many ways, the trend lines that you're seeing that look really positive, like wow, that's really definitely going in the right direction. Those w with uh, those should continue unless something goes off the rails. Uh, you know, you know, for instance, Excel suddenly stops being able to meet their their commitments. Yeah, I don't expect that, but that would be what would it take. Um, the other trend lines you'll see don't look quite as robust in in their positive direction. Those are the ones that those are the ones that, without doing something, I fear that um, they will throw us off of track. Now, whether it's in two years or in five years or in ten years, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. We'd have to do a detailed projection, but I feel pretty confident that they're going to kick us off track. In, in the relative near future. Um, EVs, for instance, electric uh, vehicle adoption is coming. Uh, projections are kind of all over the map. Um, there's projections that I think come from uh, pessimists. There's projections that come from optimists, and I don't really necessarily think either are right. <laughs> but if you kind of blend them together, you kind of come up with, a, well, by 2030, maybe 7% of the rolling stock in our community might be EV. Um, and by 2040, it's probably in the 20% without action. Now the state's interested in advancing it, the county's interested in advancing it, the feds now are interested in advancing it, and I know that we are. So, so those m numbers might go up, but I think that'll take action. It'll, mm -hmm. take, it'll take some focus, some effort. Yeah, uh, and that's maybe kind of what, where my thought was going with that is like, it's not an autopilot sort of no. thing like it's not that just we've set some changes in motion and like we can just coast from here it's the i think balancing that like the optimist in me you know was looking at these numbers and it's like cool but at the same time it's like well we got a lot more line to go certainly um with that so you know the, i like we certainly have the checkpoints that we're doing and um you know continued planning and things like that but um yeah it definitely seems that there's some areas where it's like okay well we got to keep Yes. You know, chipping away at, at these so that the downward trend continues because it won't on its own. Yeah. And, and, and I'd also like to throw out that so since the time that uh, we did the um, comprehensive plan, which of course was going on in 2018 and, and finishing up in 2019, or maybe it finished up in 2018, um, since then, uh, so our goals currently are stated to hit 80% reduction by 2050, which matches the state's goals. That's why they are there. Those goals, when we compare them to I, uh, uh, ICP, IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, the UN panel, those are outdated goals. Uh, the uh, IPCC recommends we need to reduce emissions by give or take 50% over 2018 numbers. We have to reduce them 50% by 2030, and then we have to hit carbon neutral by 2050. Carbon neutral, zero, not 80% reduction. Mm -hmm. So although those are uh, our current city stated goal is to reduce 80% by 2050, one could say that as uh, mitigation planning becomes a stronger and stronger focus, we may, we, we should probably revisit that goal. Does that still make sense given our uh, climate science and is, is it really where we want to be? Mm -hmm. So that all underscores, yes, uh, we, we should not rest on our laurels. <laughs> We've seen some positive movement. That's great. Let's take advantage of that and keep it going. Um, if I might, um, also that, you know, the comprehensive, uh, comprehensive plan was supposed to be fairly fluid. We need to keep checking on it and, re, you know, adjust it as we go to make sure that it's still up to date and makes sense for what we're doing so yeah is this is there going to be some sort of um 
are we going to continually check on this or is this like some subcommittee keep a check on this kind of a thing and if things need to be updated or is there any suggestion of that kind of thing? Well, um, Madam Chair, I would just uh, mention that we do have in the goals these uh, interim check-ins, right. which uh, we're set now for 2024. So our our task would be to bring this up in 2024 and, and see if we need to adjust those goals. Do we need to have a subcommittee start looking at that so we are ready to, you know what I mean? Like I don't want to, like we're not just going to in 2024 look at it and be like, hey, now. Right. You know, I think the work we're doing here tonight yeah. and that we'll be continuing to do throughout the year until we come up with a priority list. Sure. Uh, will help in that regard and, and okay. maybe get more clarity into what we really need to do sure. um, moving forward. Okay. So I wouldn't suggest like setting up a task force at this time, but we are it. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank so you. Um, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. It was very informative, um, Commissioner Redmond. And with that, um, it kind of flows right into the next yeah. item. Agenda item 5B, Climate Action Financing and Project Priorities. Right. So we'll move on from our greenhouse gas assessment discussion and touch on this next item. Um, so we are going to discuss the climate action financing and begin to compile a list of project priorities for city council review. So um, in your staff report, I outline that uh, one of the implementation strategies outlined in the Maplewood Climate Adaptation Plan is the creation of a city climate team. So we have designated the green team, which is a group of city employees working on uh, sustainable city operations, to serve as what we call the climate support team. So they'll be looking at um, the city operations and then the Environmental and Natural Resources Commission. So this group here tonight will serve as the city climate oversight team and you'll be uh, looking at the overall goals outlined in the climate adaptation plan. So I think we're both working on the same goal this year which is to come up with those um, climate action priorities. So it'll be good to work together on that. Um, the plan also outlined um, another implementation strategies on um, climate action financing. And it uh, mentioned researching mechanisms to implement the climate adaptation and future climate mitigation strategies. And then some of the ideas that were outlined in that plan were um, steered, tiered stormwater fees, resilient penny property tax, capturing energy savings from existing renewable energy products, um, similar to what um, Commissioner Redmond was discussing with the community solar, and then utility franchise fees. Um, so these are some ways to come up with a chunk of money uh, for future sustainable um, projects. So I brought this uh, to the green team and our city finance director, and it was determined that the best strategy is to, number one, create a list of these climate project priorities because really the city council needs to know, you know what, what they're financing um, before they can come up with a strategy on, on how to do that. So step one, um, bring the climate project priorities forward to our department heads for review present that to the city council during uh, their budget cycle uh, with finan financing options determined at that time. So that's how we're moving forward with this as suggested by our um, <clears throat> finance director. So we began this discussion with our green team last uh, meeting and they took a look at the greenhouse gas assessment similar to what you did here tonight. And then after reviewing that, um, course saw that transportation um, and buildings were the biggest contributor to the greenhouse gas in our uh, city operations. So um, we looked at kind of what's feasible, number one. Um, we know that there's several rooftops uh, that we could put solar on in our city facilities. We, we have had a solar assessment in the past. Um, and two of our new buildings, um, the 
Wakefield Park Community Building and the new North Fire Station, both, well, I'm not sure about the North Fire Station, but I know the Wakefield Park Building was uh, constructed to be solar ready. And of course we have this new North Fire Station being built right now. <clears throat> so it does seem, you know, plausible for the city to install solar on those newer buildings. Uh, the second item would be city facility electric vehicle charging stations. Um, again, we know that there's some areas that um, we could easily install these. Well, of course, everything takes money, but there's a couple new parking lots coming coming up. Uh, one in a, in a park, Goodrich Park, which might not be the best place for your first electric vehicle charging station, but of course, it's easier to place those in uh, the new the new areas rather than existing. And then Wakefield Park Community Building, that was constructed to be electric vehicle ready. And then of course we have that new North Fire Station. But really we should be looking at putting these electrical vehicle charging stations in all of our city facility parking lots. And then finally our city fleet. Uh, we've had city fleet studies uh, conducted over the years but really nothing to, to identify how we can create a greener fleet, uh, really. So that's something that we really need to uh, work on. And since none of us were experts in this area, we kind of determined that what we really need are kind of some studies in these areas to determine where they can be placed and then how they can be financed. So that is what the green team discussed, and I'm hoping that here tonight the Environmental Commission can discuss also those city operations and maybe some uh, citywide, which might not necessarily be funded by our council. So we want to, we really want to look at items that we can bring forward for financing uh, through the city. You know, of course, there's a lot that we, our community can do to reduce greenhouse gases, but not all of it can be funded by the city. So we're really focusing on items that the city can work on. Excellent. Thank you so much for the overview. Um, just kind of thinking over the years, that green team, they're like our MVPs. You know, there's so many different hats that they've worn and so many different initiatives that they've kind of taken um, and run, and it's nice that they, you know, that you, that you, <laughs> um, you know, continue to, kind of drive some some new ideas and kind of with that insight of what the city could do. Um, I m remember when we were discussing the Wakefield Park community building, like that was something that our commission felt was really important. It's like, well, we're building this building and we're already talking about, you know, I think we were reviewing probably the renewable energy ordinance at the time. And it just, it seemed like a no brainer. Like, yeah, we need this to be solar now, but at a minimum solar ready. So it is like, that seems to me to be like, let's advance that forward just to be consistent with what we've been advising um, this whole time and, and then taking that a step further for new construction for the North Fire Station, um, having, having that implemented. So that both would be rooftop solar um, and the EV charging stations. You know, both those two buildings are, are mentioned in those items. So those are my initial thoughts. Um, you know, like, yes, we would want to champion those or encourage those to, to move forward as, as far as priorities. Um, any commissioners, any other feedback that, that you'd add? Commissioner Miller? Um, I do have a question. Um, you said you were, you had been talking about having the EV charging stations in city owned parking lots, especially the newer facilities, cause it's sort of ready for that, correct? Is that? Um, you know, there is likely federal funding coming uh, for these charging stations. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be in a better position if we have a plan in place right. that identifies where these are feasible. Right. So I think that's important to put together. Okay, and um, just because I haven't seen any of them installed, like I haven't seen them being installed, um, are they standalone type of things or do they have to be connected? Is it easier for them to all be in one spot or is it okay to have one somewhere and one another place? Does that make sense? The I think the, the lot or the parking spots that you pull into, I think they just being adjacent. Like if you had, if they were all, if there were five going into one parking lot, you'd want five in one place. Right, right. Um, well, the reason one. I'm asking is because, um, 
since there's probably one or two spots in parking lots or that's what we were thinking of, um, is there a way to have like um, one side of one street through downtown that has charging spots, that kind of thing, or you know what I mean? So it's not just a parking lot while you're shopping. You know, it's actually like some place where maybe people could use that, you know, more residential. Yeah, the, like the visibility of that is right. really important. Like one, the, one question that I was going to ask is right. for these purposes, is the Maplewood Community Center considered city or YMCA property? Like just right. because it's right on White Bear Avenue, you, you know, like if anyone driving by, you'd see, you know, a dozen of these in a row, 10 of these in a row and be like, oh, that's where I could go for that. Like and a tax break for businesses that want to put one, you know, like in that kind of, we want to encourage it to the point where we want to encourage our businesses in our city limits to put one in as well. And maybe they could get some sort of a tax or something break. Um, and then my other thought was, you know, where trails cross um, streets and people park there to get onto the trails, that might be a good place to have some too that the city would own. Um, anyway, that's just what I was jotting down while you were talking. Yeah. Told you it's brainstorm day. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> These cameras keep getting better, don't they? <laughs> Um, I did have a question, Madam Chair, for yes. Um, yes, of Commissioner course. Redmond um, on this, these studies that I referred to. Uh, you referred to doing some studies for cities on, on how they can reduce their greenhouse gas assessments. What, what, are, what are these called? What type of studies are we looking at? Um, so if I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question fully, but the, the studies that are articulated in your report here, the uh, city... Uh, facility rooftop solar feasibility and funding, electric vehicle charging station feasibility and funding study, and fleet uh, study. Those are, that's pretty common terminology. Um, there, now if you kind of dial back a bit, um, you know, kind of mapping out how a community reduces its emissions across all sectors would be a, a climate mitigation plan sort of a companion piece to right. climate adaptation. Right. And in that, what you would do is look at full, full sector goals uh, to achieve interim and final targets and identify what reductions have to happen in each sector to achieve those goals and then identify actions uh, to implement both for municipal operations and uh, community-wide. So, it's exactly like the adaptation plan, except for it's focused entirely on mitigation rather than adaptation. So the question? mitigation plan might just answer all these questions for us? It, uh, no, I think uh, the specific studies that you talk about that you have here um, are, of very, of a, are of a more refined, detailed kind of focus. And a mitigation plan might list these three things as actions to take, for instance. Okay. Uh, but uh, a mitigation plan would have other actions in addition to these because, you know, although the, each of these three would be important things to do, it won't achieve our full goal. Uh, it's a good sort of momentum step forward, but, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't achieve our community-wide full uh, goal, of course. So these are excellent examples of the kinds of things that might come out of a mitigation plan. But being able to, con uh, you, you can certainly engage these before or during or after a mitigation plan, if that answers the question. I did want to mention, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, that um, we did apply for climate mitigation grant funding uh, through the MPCA. and. Uh, our application was not accepted, and we did um, include a climate mitigation study in our budget this year. So we'll see if that gets financed. So that's something that's top on our list. I was thinking about the fleet study. Um, I would guess that some good information about best practices, like, you know, based on some data exists out there. And one thing that comes to mind is as we reviewed uh, haulers when we're um, 
put the RFP out for trash and recycling hauling. Like that was something that was important for. We wanted to see that in the bids was how they're making their fleets greener. So you know we're in contract with Republic Services. I remember their proposal had some pretty, whether it was they've already made this progress or they were planning for this progress, um, you know, they are managing a fleet, not that all of their trash hauling vehicles are equal to every, you know, piece of city fleet or every component of our city fleet that we have, but perhaps there's just an overall replacement, what we're looking for, how it was done, which give you the most bang for your buck. I, I wonder if our partnership with them, you know, maybe could give us some insight into some good fleet management and improvement strategies. Just brainstorming with that, but kind of not recreating the wheel if you don't have to. Commissioner Bevin. You bet. I think uh, th there may be some things that we can learn in there. Um, another, uh, an approach in addition to uh, exploring what could be learned there is um, a, a pretty solid approach for a municipal fleet study would be to, um, so you can actually track the usage of all of the uh, city types of vehicles through the different types of usage. So you can literally monitor all vehicles or you could choose, pick and select you know, certain representative vehicles. And if you do that over a certain period of time, um, the data can then be crunched and come back with uh, an identification of use cases, you know, certain vehicles that need certain capacities, certain parameters, driving certain miles a day, et cetera. And then from that, uh, map out what vehicles are available today, what vehicles are anticipated to be uh, available in a near future, and what might be distantly available and then actually map out a, per, a, a purchase, a replacement schedule suggestion that says, these vehicles may, may make sense to focus on replacing in you know, this time frame, these vehicles replacing in that time frame. And with that kind of information that what could happen is the um, fleet management here at the city could then take that data and overlap it with their projected vehicle replacements and say, all right, then when we replace that vehicle, it's going to be EV. When we replace this piece of equipment, it's going to be hydrogen or whatever the right use cases are for those mm -hmm. instances. And by the way, with, those, with that kind of a set, you could also then, there may be some that just, you know, electrification or hydrogen or whatever may not be appropriate for some distant time frame, in which case you may decide maybe we'll look into biodiesel for replacement of fuel in certain instances, right? So that, that kind of a study, you could get uh, very dialed in on a specific roadmap for um, which vehicles should be turned over by when in relation to the city's purchasing expectations anyway. Um, I, I really like that because it would make sense to look at a different time frame for maybe vehicles that don't leave properties would be electric or you know ones that just go between certain properties but always have a home base but you know as opposed to ones that are used in emergency situations kind of thing so that makes a lot of sense or hauling or something more stressful however yeah lots of different kinds of vehicles in the fleet and usage yeah because yeah That's ones me. that don't leave properties you know little golf carts running around you know <laughs> it makes yeah. sense yeah. to mm -hmm. you know it makes sense to do something like that I thought we could also uh, touch on Commissioner Redmond's um, ideas that were identified in the greenhouse gas assessment, mm -hmm. uh, the areas where we could get the most bang for our buck, which were generally um, reduction in natural gas consumption, reduction in vehicle miles traveled, and increase in EV. Uh, so that was citywide. And then city operations decrease fleet fuel consumption and increase EV. And this one, I'm not sure I got it right, but decrease in water consumption and was it wastewater? Mm -hmm. And wastewater. So stormwater? Or no, not stormwater. Yeah, uh, just, you know, uh, what, goes, what gets flushed down the drain? That kind of water, yeah. okay. <laughs> Yes, uh, we do not track our water very closely. Um, we do 
track our electric and gas use uh, through B3, and we could be monitoring our water through that as well. Um, however, I, I do have a pretty good idea now um, through this last uh, Green Step Cities metrics, I was able to obtain all of our um, water usage, which of course you use for the greenhouse gas assessment. Yeah, so we could be tracking that closer. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Ms. Finwell, do you, for some reason I, I couldn't find, I looked this up earlier and I totally forgot about it, otherwise I would have looked a little bit harder. Are we still not able to do gray water things in the city? I don't know what the state code is currently. I, think. I remember for some reason that that was something we couldn't have a gray water system on a property, for that, but I can't remember. That was a really long time ago that we discussed that. Uh, state building code would mm -hmm. um, cover that, and I'm not sure what the rules are currently. Okay. Would that be something so that I can... So gray water uh, using wastewater, not wastewater, but uh, gray water, yeah. like mm -hmm. right. from showers or whatever, right. to... Water your plants. Plants, right. Okay, got it. Yeah, like the ones with the, you know, sometimes you can have the sink on top of the toilet, you know, so you can use. Anyway, I just, I, for some reason, I, that triggered a memory that we had talked about it at some point. I didn't know if, if you had that or if I could get that information or you could let me know how to get that information. <laughs> yeah, I'll check with our building official. Okay, cool. I Thanks. know it was um, proposed at the uh, South Fire Station, some sort of gray water implementation there but it, it was never installed yeah for some reason I was thinking that we weren't able to because that we wanted to do something and but I just yeah if I could find that out that would be great because that'd be something I'd be interested in kind of looking into thank you Ooh, also park and rides for the EV that popped into my brain <laughs> you know where you park and then get on public transportation Having EV plugins there, mm -hmm. I'm all over. <laughs> I'm we have several today. of those in Maplewood. Of course, those are um, operated by the Met Metro, Metro Transit. Transit. Right. Mm. Well, I was just thinking that if if the federal money came through, that would cross boundaries a little bit. Maybe that could yeah. be a suggestion. Thanks. So to clarify kind of our discussion this evening, the three priorities that are in the packet here um, is what the city climate team uh, came up with as, as suggestions. And so the goal was to get some feedback on those because then that goes into, you know, through city operations and identifies funding sources for the priorities that are, are put in place. Um, so we've kind of discussed a, a, a few things, but I'm wondering if we don't need to make a motion or anything like that, but just kind of wondering, you know, from our discussion, are there more specific outcomes that, that you're hoping for um, to, you know, to go back or um, where we could kind of funnel our discussion here to be most productive? Um, I know that one of the things that we had talked about quite a bit at length is um, using the savings from like our solar, um, uh, not the credit, so now I'm losing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our community solar, like the, the savings that we would get from that to fund other things. I know that we talked about that quite a bit, and that would actually cover quite a bit if we put that into some sort of fund or something. Mm -hmm. And I really think that that, when we talked about it at length before, it really made a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I remember discussing that. I'm trying to think of what the time frame was when, you know, that was kind of um, identified. I think there's millions of dollars just sitting there waiting for it. Uh, Madam Chair, <laughs> on, on that note, I brought that up to our finance director and, um, you know, maybe that's something that could take place eventually. Yeah. But really, it's it's just like tapping into the general fund, right. you know. It's a savings, but it's not really reflected as a savings anywhere. Do we track it? We do track it. And, you know, maybe that, that will be the result of this, right. you know, once we have all the, our priorities, where are we gonna get that money? Hey, we could, you know, but just calling it money that's just sitting out there, not doing anything, 
because we saved it, mm -hmm. you know, is, yeah. is apparently not the case. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I think that if we make sure that if we're tracking it, that these are savings as a result of the things that we're doing, mm -hmm. um, then we'd have a little bit better of a, a leg to stand on when we ask for something like that. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. You know, my my thought overall is that, you know, the three priorities were developed after reviewing the information that we went through tonight. So, you know, I find myself in agreement with, with just about all these things that and there's things that I think make a lot of sense to, to move forward with and continue or like to, you know, co we confirm that their priority is, you know, based on the information that, that we just went through as well. Um, but certainly think that the fleet study um, could really be impactful as well to identify, you know, it's miles as well as, you know, the, the types that we're using, what, what usage, where could just from day-to-day -day efficiencies of, you know, how we're driving, what routes, you know, are, are being driven, you know, some, some savings and, and uh, reduction that could be realized there as well as the replacement, you know, strategies for down the road when vehicles need to be replaced and that goes into the capital budget or, or whatnot, but that there's a clear data-driven information that informs what those purchasing decisions are so that when that comes up, it's like, a, oh, we follow the flow chart and this is what we're, what we're going to buy. So I feel like that's, that's something to, to dig into. Right. Commissioner Redman. Thank you. Uh, I have, um, I think I have two comments, although one just sort of missed it out of my brain. But the, uh, the first comment is the, uh, the city facility electric vehicle charging station feasibility study. I would, I would definitely encourage thinking about making that city facility and citywide. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. First of all, like in debating like, well, should it go at this facility or that facility? I mean, part of it is what makes sense for the facility itself and where might convenient opportunities be. But the second is also understanding how well might, the first ones that you put in, you want them to be as used as much as possible, you know, because we want to, and of course, EVs are a smaller share than they will be in a couple of years and so forth. So it, it'll be a smaller usage today than it will be in three and five years and so forth. But you still want them to be as, as meaningful as possible so that each, the first ones are as powerful as possible and help support the next one. So by studying it in context of the overall community, you can start to understand, well, at this location, it's got these advantages from a municipal operation perspective, but this one's got uh, advantages in terms of supporting. We see, you know, high demand for EV charging likely in this corridor and in that corridor, and it, and it relates to public transit or whatever, right? So you get the other layers of community benefit. The other reason why expanding it to a community-wide study is that we can help map out where might we want to encourage EVs uh, charging station to occur to help make sure that, uh, you know, folks in multifamily housing might have access to them or people that are uh, you know driving in from some place to use uh, public transit have access or that it uh, relates to uh, uh, you know reinforcing our retail corridors you know all those sorts of gestures that make sense from a community building standpoint I mean we map out uh, it's no different from all land uses. We cities map out land use. Uh, it doesn't say that we're building the land use. It says that we're trying to help guide where those investments make sense. And if we do that from a community perspective, A, we can help guide where it might make sense to begin with, and B, that might set us up, might, maybe, because I don't know how things are going to be funded, but the funding that comes out of the federal focus may very well support the ability to say, hey, we've got a community-wide master plan, we've got 20 stations, we're gonna use this plan, we're gonna reach out to the uh, facility owners and maybe, you know, maybe there's something we can figure out to access federal funding, right? So, so from that perspective, I really think that, that we, we should consider expanding it to a community-wide as well as specific city focus, you know? And it would make sense to talk to neighboring cities as well, so we could kind of make sure that areas are available. Um, if they're doing one right on the border, that we know. <laughs> yeah. 
can kind of double our efforts that way. Oh, Madam Chair, <clears throat> well, thank you for your review of, of the greenhouse gas assessment and uh, possible projects. Commissioner Redmond is remembered. Or the yes. Mist has re the mist is, uh, re I was stalling for him. <laughs> Please <laughs> proceed. Please I proceed. I should write notes because my brain is a sieve. But, uh, uh, so the other comment I was going to throw out there, and this is a pot stirring comment, so forgive me, everybody. But, um, and, I, and I hear and, and recognize the intelligence of identifying specific projects with specific dollar values that then go in front of the council for approval or whatever the proper approval is for expenditure of that size completely makes sense in addition to that uh, I would suggest considering what would it look like to say that's awesome idea that's fantastic but in order to build some momentum what if we also suggested that we establish that the city establish a fund a resilience fund a climate fund a sustainability, whatever you wants to be called, um, could be funded in all sorts of different ways. Maybe the ear tag of some kind of internal fund is one way. And its dollar value could be established in one of two directions. One is, well, let's build up a map for projects over the next 10 years and see what that looks like. Um, might be difficult, things might change. The other is just to simply say, well, what's a reasonable balance that the city could say, well, we can set aside $50,000 or 60, what, I'm making up a number, but we can set aside a value and that's earmarked and it does not get spent until a specific project is identified, but it's there annually uh, from which actions can be drawn. And, and the value of setting up a, a, f a resilience fund like that is that it establishes an, an expectation that the city will continue to move in its in its resilience efforts and so then you can identify an adaptation uh, measure you could identify a mitigation measure and and start anticipating those annually you know and, and it just becomes a part of the process so uh, so simply earmarking it doesn't mean that it's that it's spent it would still relate to projects that come forth and everybody says yeah that's a great that's a good idea we should do that um, but it at least establishes an expectation that we're all understanding we're going to develop more momentum in that direction. I'm glad that thought came back. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a follow-up thought, too. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if I were to number the priorities that the city uh, climate team came up with, I, th I feel like the rooftop solar and the city fleet study would be my number one and two with the EV charging stations being third or maybe a little bit distant from there. Not that they're not important, but I think about the usage of the specific buildings that are suggested in this um, Wakefield Park, North Fire Station and Goodrich Park with parks being, you know, so in the community, so many people are walking or biking to them already. Um, thinking of um, some of the plans that we've reviewed over the years for parks, really parking has been minimized. Like the parking lots have shrunk maybe in, in city parks compared to if they were planning a park 50 years ago, for example. Um, you know, that it, you know people are getting there maybe not in the same way that they're driving to work. And the North Fire Station, if, you know, maybe a priority for EV charging station would be if our city, like, you know, if ambulance and, and fire trucks were electric vehicles that were charging there. That would be a reason to put it in, but there's not a reason for the general public to go to the fire station and plug in their vehicle. I mean, they could hang out with the firefighters. That probably would be fine, you know, in many cases, but probably um, a lower use. I think prioritizing, um, making a plan, you know, for EV charging stations in the community where they would get used, where they'd be most visible, where they would encourage people of like, okay, this is an infrastructure that if I'm thinking about replacing my, my vehicle, like I, I've seen enough of these around that I, I feel like, hey, I'm not going to be stranded somewhere without somewhere to, you know, charge my car. So if I've seen it around, and, and I think that's more partnering with, you know, other, um, with, you know, businesses in the city, um, schools, 
what whatnot, but maybe that would be a little bit more community based than city initiative based where the other two installing solar and doing the fleet study would be able to be driven by the city a little bit more effectively. Am I for some reason I think that I saw some E V stations actually getting removed. Is that do you know any of that? Have you heard of like from the Ramsey County Library, was that one being removed? I had heard that apparently it's outdated technology. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that maybe waiting until there's more of a uh, um, a need and a, a drive for that might be a better mm -hmm. idea too. Because I, I was just thinking of that. I, I remember seeing that and I was like, oh, I'm so glad that that's there. And people were using it and then all of a sudden people weren't and then it's gone. <laughs> and I'm like, ooh. So... Yeah, apparently yeah. something about it was costing more to upgrade it than right. putting in a new one. Right. So they removed that. But it was one. It was the first EV right. charging station in Maplewood, I, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think if even if we like partner with maybe some of the, since we have such a, a vast amount of electrical vehicles, sales places in our, um, within our city limits, maybe mm -hmm. that would be a good partnership at some point too just to see if we wouldn't have to foot the bill for everything anyway yeah part of that overall study uh, we have been tracking EV charging stations mm -hmm. um, during green step cities and each year it does increase uh, off the top of my head was it 50 ch charging no does that sound right 50 charging stations in the city right now I think that's well, hidden. and I think it'll it'll be better with more education because, like, I, I know my neighbors have um, hybrid ones and a couple of um, EV vehicles, and you know that you're not stranded. It's you know then it just goes over to gas or you know the battery or whatever. Um, but with more education with the, in the general public, I think that'll be something maybe a little bit further down the line. I can see that for sure. But the other ones, there's more of a, a immediate um, benefit. And, and results, the other two. Yeah, so um, I was going to kind of summarize uh, before you had that bright idea, which I'm so glad because that'll be part of my summary here, which um, we're really building uh, a report is what we'll be doing. And um, I think it'll be important to put you know, our immediate needs, um, the priorities, and in addition, you know, clarify that, uh, you know, while these are the items that we think are most important at this time or most feasible, uh, we also feel that having this more permanent um, funding source is important. And, you know, I did, of course, bring this up to the finance director, but um, some of the issues that were pointed out to me is that, um, you know, there's just so many competing budgetary needs in a city um, where it would be ch maybe challenging for the council to approve a funding mechanism for something they don't know what they're funding for when they've got all these other things they have to pay for. So, and they would have to monitor it and manage it, right? But that's not to say that we shouldn't present it that way. So I agree. So I will uh, refine all this and bring it back uh, next month just to kind of finalize. Sounds good. Thank you. For, is it? Okay. Well, how about uh, we didn't add a commissioner presentation, but we'll give just a brief thing. Okay. So um, the agenda, revisiting the agenda here, uh, we didn't add anything or didn't have anything, I should say, for agenda item six, unfinished business. We do not have any visitors this